Hey guys, this is Joseph from StarDataEngineering.com. In this video, I want to talk about the concepts behind building a low effort ETL system um, using managed open source providers. As always, if you want to follow this along in the blog format, you could follow the link in the description below. Uh, this video is going to be a little bit different in that we are not going to be doing a lot of coding, but we are going to be talking about the concepts behind designing uh, ETL system. Uh, if you do want to build a simple ETL system and follow along with code, uh, you could follow the, the link in the description below. My blog has all the code you need and the instructions uh, to integrate different systems. So let's get started. One of the very common use cases in a data engineering project is to design a ETL system for data warehousing. Basically what you will have is you'll have multiple data sources such as application databases, data stored in S3, um, text files or CSV stored in like SFTP servers, FTP servers, etc. And it is up to you to bring these all together into a data warehouse um, as a source of truth which data users can then um, access. So these data users may be like data scientists or analysts or engineers or other dashboard app level applications um, are going to be using this data warehouse. Right? So when someone is trying to set this up the usual questions are something like I have X amount of data or X GB of data what tools sh should I use and and or oh my team has five engineers or five analysts. We want to keep it simple, but we want to also make sure it's industry standard. So these are really good questions to ask before starting any project because that will help, these questions will help you design um, the appropriate ETL system for you and your company and future needs uh, and the company's future needs as well. So before we start any um, designing um, any uh, system designs, we really want to understand what the data is. So what I mean by that is really understanding how that data is generated by the business um, or application. Why do people care about this data? And how frequently do they access certain data sets? So knowing all these will help you prioritize your work and also understand how to model your data better. The second point to keep in mind is documentation. Whenever you create a new data model or a data pipeline, it's always, always good to document your uh, process because this will not only help you in the future, but it will also help your teammates and members from other team to kind of understand what that data means and how they can access it or how they can modify it. Um, the last point uh, is data quality. So since you're creating a data warehouse, it's going to be the source of truth for many data users. And you want to make sure that the quality of the data is 100%. Um, in order to make sure um, of the, about the quality of the data, you want to have some monitoring and alerting system set up that alert you in case of qual any sort of like data quality issues. Right. All right, so let's get into the different components of a data engineering platform or a data pipeline, you could say. The the three most obvious ones are extracting, transforming, and loading data. So you're extracting data from some source systems, transforming it according to business or data model logic, and then loading it into the destination table. Usually, uh, companies also have dashboards, such as like Looker or Tableau, or Metabase, if you want to go the open source route, or Superset where users can write queries and they can create visualizations to easily make intelligent um, kind of decisions about the future of the business. And on top of that, um, DevOps, if you have a DevOps team, usually does monitoring, alerting, and scheduling. Well, scheduling may be done by engineers as well. So monitoring and alerting um, is used to monitor the data pipeline and alert um, the appropriate uh, stakeholders in case of failures or data quality issues. And scheduling, um, you, w you specify how frequently you want to run the data pipeline. Um, ETL versus ELT. So ETL is kind of like the traditional framework where you extract data from multiple sources, do some transformations according to business logic, um, and then load it into the source or excuse me, destination tables. ELT is the same, but in a different order. 
um, because um, the recent data warehouse uh, warehouses like Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift Spectrum, they allow separation of storage and execution and these storages are really cheap. What has become easier now is to actually just load everything into your data warehouse and then transform as necessary and hence it's called ELT extract load and then transform. One thing to keep in mind is data pipelines are complex systems so you want to try to keep it as simple as possible um, in order to reduce complexity and um, <coughs> in order to keep up like a pace of delivering new features if you will because the more complex it gets the slower it's going to be to develop new data uh, pipelines or new features if you will in general um, so in most cases if you keep the, your data engineering platform pipeline kind of uh, simple it can help you um, deploy develop and deploy new data pipelines faster get new engineers up to speed faster you will spend um, you, you want to spend less time worrying about the actual management of the service than the actual execution of your data pipeline so you don't want to be spending a lot of time managing your airflow servers but you want to be writing um, DAGs that do the data pipelining and it will decrease the complexity your team or you will be providing more business value it will decrease the overall engineering cost um, because you wouldn't be spending so many engineering hours which as we all know is quite expensive on um, these complex data pipelines <coughs> so one way to reduce the, this complexity is to use a managed open source service provider um, such as Stitch which is built on top of Singer.io or Astronomer which is built on top of um, Airflow um, so when you use these you're actually using open source systems but you're letting someone else manage these systems for you this is kind of like a software as a service uh, system where they manage these servers for you and all you have to do is um, set up like a source and destination in terms of stitch um, and they will manage those underlying uh, data capture uh, systems for you so here's a kind of quick comparison of open source and managed services um, one thing to be concerned about when you're using managed services is the vendor something called vendor lock-in so what that means is when you're using a vendor tool or vendor system um, you want to make sure that the underlying system is open source so you know or kind of know what's actually going on but if it is not um, certain vendor tools you have no idea what's going on under the hood um, it's kind of uh, tricky because it'll make um, make the understanding of the system that much more difficult and also if you have more complex requirements or want to move off of the vendor systems it will again make these moves much more difficult than if, are, if you are using a open source managed service provider so that basically covers like what you need to be aware of before de uh, designing your ELT system in my blog I'll leave the link in the description below um, I go over designing a simple ELT system um, using Postgres, um, AWS S3, Stitch and DBT and uh, automating that, setting up monitoring and alerting in case something goes wrong. So if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, go to the link in the description below and you'll have a detailed explanation of how to get that system up and running. Um, as always, if you have any questions, um, ask them in the comment section below and if you like this video please like and subscribe and share and all that stuff um, it helps me a lot um, thank you for your time